Off-road vehicles marred with hundreds of bullets, several lifeless bodies sprawled under the Mexican heat, the Army, National Guard, State, and National Police, and even the Red Cross working together at a crime scene. Ref wondering how all this came to be. Well, in the bloody massacre of Ensenada, here's what you get when you lose 39 tons of cartel drugs. Cocaine seizure and cartel operations. In May every year, tens of amateur drivers attend a two-day rally competition in Ensenada, Baja, California. This competition, known as Cachanilazo, is supposed to be a fun time for lovers of off-road vehicles. Ref, you know, a time to stir up some dust before the rainy season properly sets in. But around 2.18 p.m. on day two of the event, it wasn't water wetting the dusty grounds of Ensenada. It was the blood of 20 rally drivers and spectators, 10 dead and 9 injured. Ref, a few days before the shootout, the Mexican Navy, serving as the Coast Guard in collaboration with the Customs and Maritime Authorities of the Port of Ensenada, confiscated three containers having about 39,820 kilograms of cocaine-contaminated material on a container ship. The naval unit stated that the containers held the materials and that samples were sent to the pharmacology and toxicology laboratories of the Secretary of the Navy and the National Customs Agency of Mexico for analysis, which came back positive for cocaine. The Attorney General of Mexico, FGR, is investigating the seizure, but it is unclear whether the entire entire weight is primarily cocaine or if the materials were only contaminated with the substance. However, one certain thing is that the criminal groups involved were competing for control of drug smuggling routes and profits from illicit human trafficking, as Baja California has been plagued by violence in recent years due to gang disputes over drug trafficking routes to the U.S. and local drug sales. On May 24th, investigators made a significant announcement regarding the arrest of three suspects linked to the shootout in Baja California, Mexico. The arrested suspects have been identified by their first names, namely Edgardo, Luis Felipe, and Hugo. It is common practice for Mexican authorities to withhold the last names of suspects in public statements. The last names of the arrested suspects weren't the only information that remains undisclosed. State Prosecutor Ricardo Ivan Carpio Sanchez said their investigation led them to an address near Ensenada, where a search warrant was served. Inside the home, authorities found guns, what appeared to be hard drugs, and items that are believed to be tied to the shooting. A white Ford expedition with California plates was also located, but its connection to the crime was unclear. Authorities also uncovered connections between the criminal groups and corrupt elements within law enforcement agencies. Several police officers and officials were implicated for their involvement in protecting and aiding the criminal organizations, further highlighting the deep-rooted challenges faced in combating organized crime in Mexico. Not just that, communities affected by the violence came together in solidarity, holding vigils and demanding justice for the victims. Civil society organizations and human rights advocates advocates called for a comprehensive approach that prioritizes the protection of innocent lives and addresses the underlying issues driving the cycle of violence. The weapons located and confiscated by members of the Mexican National Defense Agency, known as Sedina, include three 9mm handguns, 59 loaded cartridges, three magazines, and two packages that appeared to contain methamphetamine and marijuana. The authorities hope, however, that the arrest of these three suspects will further lead to the arrest of all other perpetrators of the crime. Carpio said that Mexican officials officials believe that there were at least eight people who participated in the confrontation. He also said in a statement that they would not allow anyone to damage social peace, and anyone who tries to do so through criminal acts would be pursued until they are found and brought to justice to pay for the crimes they have committed. Several attempts by both the media and the public to know what cartel they belong to were made, but that too remains undisclosed. However, the development marks a significant step forward in the ongoing investigation of the incident, as authorities work diligently to unravel unravel the circumstances surrounding the shootout and bring those responsible to justice. The Cachanillazo rally turns deadly. During the Cachanillazo rally, a group of the drivers had pulled over to buy gas in San Vicente, around 50 miles south of Ensenada. They planned to refill their tanks before continuing the next leg of the rally. However, they weren't done filling their tanks when a gray van arrived, from which people got out and began shooting long weapons at the parked vehicles. Over 250 shots were fired from at least 13 weapons, including handguns and rifles. Ref. Some drivers were killed in their vehicles, while others died while trying to flee for their lives. Among those killed was a 19-year-old teenager, 
Yosu Herrera, an American who lived in nearby San Diego. A few days after the tragic incident, Herrera's mother, Aime Herrera, and aunt, Graciela Rojas, told NBC7 and Telemundo 20 that he went to the Cachanillazo with his friends to be happy. The family of Herrera mentioned how concerned they all were about him going to Mexico in the first place because traveling there could be very dangerous sometimes. So when they heard the news about the shooting on Facebook, they feared the worst, and soon they got a call from Mexican authorities about a body that needed to be identified. And sure enough, it was Josue Ref. We kept calling him over and over, but he didn't answer, Rojas said. We thought maybe he misplaced his phone or got turned around somewhere. We held on to hope, believing we'd eventually locate him safe and sound. But that's not all. Among the ten people was another San Diegan who came to drive as well, but was killed during the massacre, Roberto Isaias Tito Ayala. In fact, having an off-road vehicle was always a great dream of his, and he'd finally gotten one a few days before Cachanilazo. Ref. So, with Ensenada being less than a two-hour drive from California, the stars seemed to have aligned for Tito to try out his new ride. He was at that San Vicente gas station when the attackers killed the father, who is survived by his wife and four-year-old daughter. Ayala's family expressed that the truck driver was an innocent bystander who got caught in the midst of the conflict. Ayala's cousin, Genesis Romero, who regarded Ayala as more than just a cousin, described how Ayala was in Baja, California, living out one of his dreams, owning an off-road vehicle. According to Romero, Ayala had recently acquired his dream off-road vehicle just days before the rally took place. Romero shared that Ayala's sole intention was to enjoy riding his new toy and have a good time without any other ulterior motives. Ayala's wife, Sitlali, who was present with him during the incident, told Telemundo 20 that a group of racers had stopped at a gas station near Ensenada when they suddenly found themselves fleeing from gunfire. There were also rumors going around about the supposed execution of a popular influencer and restaurant owner, Jorge Cueva, known as Mr. Tempo, who happens to be the proud owner of the King and Queen franchise in Valle de Guadalupe. However, these rumors were dismissed after Mr. Tempo posted on his social media announcing that he was safe. I'm fine, thank God. We did the route and we had nothing to do with what happened. An accident. I'm very sorry for the attack and their families, but thank God we're fine, he said. You might be wondering if there's more to these guys' lives that I haven't shared with you. Was Joju actually involved in drug dealing as a rising star? Or was Tito secretly working as a hitman for a cartel? Perhaps there's something undisclosed about Mr. Tempo as well. Well, the answer to all these questions is no. The target. From all the information, these were innocent rally drivers who genuinely wanted a good time. And they weren't alone either. Most of the people killed on that fateful day weren't the main targets at all. In fact, one man was the major target on that fateful day, Alonso Arambula Pina, a.k.a. El Trebel or The Clover. El Trebel was one of the leaders in the Arellano Felix Cartel, also known as the Tijuana Cartel. The assassinated criminal leader was passionate about off-road vehicles and regularly posted about them on social media. His Instagram page featured several several pictures and clips of him in various ATV events, wearing his complete gear with the number 15 on both his wear and on his Canem X3, but his face remained covered by his racing helmet. In many published videos, he is mostly seen with several people also in this type of vehicle, waiting for the landing of small planes in the middle of mountainous terrain. According to witnesses and videos that circulated on that fateful day on social networks, the attackers, dressed in black, got out of the truck and opened fire on a group of razors. As soon as they heard the first shots, the rest of the the people participating in the walk quickly scattered, desperately seeking hiding places to ensure their safety. After the horrifying incident, heartbreaking videos revealed the victims' lifeless bodies left behind in vehicles and scattered across the street, painting a devastating scene of chaos and tragedy. In a race against time, the emergency forces sprang into action, swiftly rushing to the scene. With utmost urgency, they tended to the injured, managing to rescue and transport nine individuals in need of medical attention. Sadly, ten lives were lost. One interesting story story came from that of a well-known prosecutor of Baja, California, who goes by the name Ricardo Carpio. He revealed that the direct target of this aggression is the person who was driving the vehicle marked with the number 15 and which had a stamp of a clover. Yeah. He also explained that Arambula Pina allegedly had ties to the Sinaloa cartel, led by the sons of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who is imprisoned in the United States, and that the attack was the result of disputes that the group has with the Tijuana cartel. He added that some of the other victims victims were involved in illicit activities, particularly drug trafficking, but did not say whether they died, were among the ten injured, or participated as pilots. Ricardo did mention that the vehicle used by the shooters had a theft notification in the United States in April. No wonder they left the car at the scene of the shootout. Pina's criminal empire and drug trafficking. 
In El Trabol's photos and videos, he never reveals his face as he always wears his racing helmet. However, there was a moment when a media outlet called Punto Norte published a photograph of him without his helmet. And according to Metropolimx, El Trebol used to spend his time socializing in both Baja California and Sinaloa. Ref El Trebol was a notorious figure who was heavily involved in drug trafficking operations from Mexico into the United States. Through the extensive data collected by various means of communication, law enforcement agencies and intelligence services were able to build a detailed profile of Pina's criminal activities. Pina's organization had established a vast network that stretched across the border between Mexico and the United States. He was known for his involvement in smuggling large quantities of illicit drugs, such as cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, into the U.S. The information collected indicated that Pina's operation was responsible for a significant portion of the drug trade in the region. Law enforcement agencies had been actively investigating Pina and his criminal empire for quite some time. The data collected through communication channels, including phone intercepts, surveillance, and informants, provided crucial insights into Pina's illicit activities, enabling law enforcement to track his operations and gather more evidence against him. The investigation revealed that Pina's organization had established a sophisticated supply chain, utilizing various methods to transport drugs across the border. They employed individuals known as mules, who would smuggle drugs in hidden compartments of vehicles or on their persons. Pina's operation also utilized tunnels, drug mules on foot, and even drones to transport narcotics, constantly adapting their methods to evade law enforcement. Now, don't get me wrong, none of the law enforcement agencies had a hand in the assassination of El Trebol. According to Alvarez's news site, the armed attack registered Saturday during a racing rally in the San Vicente delegation of Ensenada, Baja, California, that left 10 dead and 9 wounded was the result of a struggle between the Jalisco Cartel New Generation and the Sinaloa Cartel. In recent events, the Sinaloa Cartel targeted Alonso Arambula Pina, and according to local media reports, it was mentioned that El Trebol, formerly associated with the Sinaloa Cartel, had switched allegiances to the Arellano Felix Cartel. This change in affiliation sparked a violent rivalry with the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Take note, the Jalisco Cartel New Generation, CJANG, is a known criminal organization in Mexico that has emerged from conflicts, internal disputes, and captures within existing cartels. This group has gained center stage for its brutal tactics and its skillful use of public public relations. El Trebol had his enemies hunting him. That's why when he stopped around 2 p.m., he was attacked by the crew of a recent model gray pickup truck on Saturday at kilometer 90 of the Transpeninsular Highway in Ensenada, just when he was planning to get his gas tank refilled and maybe shop at an OXO store. From here on out, we will be looking at what caused the incident and what happened afterward. But first, let us take a look at the sides involved in the battle, and that including the cartel names and their history, cartel feuds, and the bloody consequences. Upon investigation by the police and law enforcement agents, the shootout was found to be caused by a feud between two drug cartels, the Arellano Felix Cartel and the Sinaloa Cartel. The Tijuana Cartel, or Cartel Arellano Felix, CAF is a Mexican drug cartel based and founded in Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico, in 1987. Founded by the Arellano Felix family and has its territory in Mexico and San Diego, Los Angeles in the United States, the cartel is notoriously known for illegal activities such as drug trafficking, money laundering, people smuggling, murder, arms trafficking, and bribery. It once was described as one of the biggest and most violent criminal groups in Mexico. The cartel has lots of allies and also lots of rivals, with the Sinaloa cartel being one of its major rivals. The Sinaloa cartel, known to be involved in organized crimes, drug cartels, and drug trade, was headed by Joaquin Guzman. Known as El Chapo for his short, stocky frame, 55-year-old Guzman is a legendary figure in Mexico and has survived many enemies and accomplices, which is rare in the drug trade where one's career often meets a tragic end. In fact, it is reported that he sold more drugs than Pablo Escobar did at the height of his career. This success was largely due to America's high demand for illegal drugs. To put in simple terms, Mexico, the world's biggest supplier of narcotics, and the United States, the world's biggest consumer of narcotics, are neighbors. The Sinaloa cartel can purchase a kilo of cocaine for $2,000 in Colombia or Peru and sell it for more than $10,000 in Mexico. If they cross the border into the United States, it can sell for $30,000 wholesale, and if they break it down into grams, it can sell for more than $100,000, which is more than its weight in gold. The Sinaloa cartel is quite unique among Mexican cartels because of its diversified operations and vertical integration. It has its hands in multiple ventures, including the production and exportation of marijuana, heroin, and methamphetamine. Since the Sinaloa cartel made its move into Baja, California back in 2006, things took a turn for the Tijuana cartel. The influence of the notorious 
notorious Arellano Felix brothers dwindled, and the Tijuana cartel was reduced to just a few scattered cells. In an attempt to regain strength, the organization underwent a transformation in 2016 and rebranded itself as the Cartel Tijuana Nueva Generation, New Generation Tijuana Cartel. They joined forces with the Jalisco New Generation Cartel and the Beltran Leva Organization, BLO, to form an alliance aimed at countering the dominance of the Sinaloa Cartel. Under the leadership of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, this coalition became a formidable opposition to the Sinaloa Cartel's operations. Quite the people, wouldn't you agree? And all this because of some feud? Who controls Ensenada territory and its smuggling routes? To get a better idea of who's the boss in this story, let's take a look at who controls the Encenda territory itself, locally referred to as La Cenicienta del Pacifico, the Cinderella of the Pacific. Ensenada is a coastal city in Mexico, lying 125 kilometers south of San Diego. Back in the day when European explorers first stumbled upon the region, the human Indians inhabited the area, and tribal groups such as the Kilua, Pai Pai, and Kumeyaay still existed at that time. These indigenous communities were semi-nomadic and inhabited the Bay Area and interior valleys of the Sierra de Juarez and San Pedro Martir. They maintained a close connection with the land, appreciating and respecting the remarkable natural beauty that enveloped these regions. You know, the Ensenada territory is actually part of the state of Baja California, which is under the control of the Mexican government. Baja California is one of the 32 federal entities of Mexico, and Ensenada happens to be one of its municipalities. But other than the government, the President Municipal, also known as the Chief of Government during the Spanish and American colonial periods, call the shots and ensure things are running smoothly in Ensenada and other areas under their jurisdiction. In English language publications, these positions are sometimes referred to as mayors, but these are all just minor information. What the general public doesn't know is that there are smuggling routes in Mexico that are under the control of three cartels, the Gulf, Sinaloa, and Tijuana, with Tijuana being the least powerful. The Tijuana cartel, also known as the Arellano Felix cartel, was once considered one of the largest and most violent criminal groups in Mexico. But ever since the Sinaloa cartel's arrival in Baja California in 2006 and the fall of the Arellano Felix brothers, the Tijuana cartel's influence diminished. Mexican and U.S. authorities claim that the Sinaloa cartel dominates most of Tijuana, but the Tijuana cartel holds an edge over their rivals, a long-standing family with business and political connections throughout the city. On top of that, the Tijuana cartel charges the Sinaloa cartel a toll, Pizo, for trafficking drugs in their territory, proving that they still hold control over the local drug trade. Despite suffering law losses and the arrest of important members, the Tijuana cartel still wields significant power in the state of Baja, California. The Sinaloa cartel is recognized by the United States intelligence community as the largest and most potent drug trafficking organization globally. But that's not all because, according to the National Drug Intelligence Center and other U.S. sources, the cartel is involved in the distribution of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, fentanyl, cannabis, and MDMA. In June 2020, reports revealed that the Sinaloa cartel had taken over a significant portion of the Tijuana cartel's former territory. The Tijuana cartel formed an alliance with the Jalisco New Generation cartel, which quickly fell apart because of the Jalisco cartel's self-interest in replacing the Sinaloa cartel as the top dog instead of helping the Tijuana cartel regain its dominance. After successfully removing the Jalisco cartel's influence in Baja, California, the Tijuana cartel is now vying for control of the Tijuana Plaza and its surrounding areas with the Sinaloa cartel. In November 2020, emissary from the Los Chapitos faction of the Sinaloa cartel were spotted in Tijuana, attempting to form an alliance with the now resurgent Tijuana cartel. Despite being the second most dominant drug cartel in Mexico, the Sinaloa cartel is facing internal strife, as are other cartels like Gulf and Juarez. Efforts and Actions Against Cartels Back in March, a distressing incident occurred where four U.S. citizens, after crossing the border for a trip to get a medical procedure, were abducted in Mexico, tragically resulting in the loss of two lives. This incident swiftly brought attention back to the highly debated topic of border security and led certain lawmakers to urge the Biden administration to take stronger actions against cartels. The efforts of various agencies, such as the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, and the FBI, have been commendable as they are tirelessly working to dismantle, disrupt, 
disrupt and ultimately bring to justice the leaders of the cartels, along with the extensive networks that they heavily rely upon. Attorney General Merrick Garland addressed the media on Tuesday, assuring reporters that every possible measure is being taken to tackle this pressing issue. Officials also pointed out that President Biden recently took action by signing an order that grants the Treasury Department broader powers to impose penalties on cartels. Additionally, the Department of Homeland Security diligently screens and vets every individual encountered at the border. President Biden has expressed support for funding initiatives aimed at enhancing border security measures. Furthermore, he has emphasized that curbing the influx of fentanyl across the border ranks high on his list of priorities. Notably, U.S. authorities have seized a quantity of drugs this year that is twice the amount confiscated in 2020. Due to the turning events, President Biden made a visit to Mexico to meet with President Lopez Obrador. They talked about a lot of things, like border security, immigration, handling the COVID-19 situation, boosting the economy, and finding ways to work together on these matters. Of course, there were a few tense moments during their talks, but both leaders emphasized the need to come together, find common solutions, and address these important issues. It's all about cooperation and finding ways to make things better for both countries. We reaffirmed our commitment to working together for the well-being of our peoples and nations, Lopez Obrador said on Twitter. This communication between the leaders resulted in a change of stance, alleviating the tension that had existed between the United States and Mexico. Mexico's president also visited the city of Tijuana and delivered a national address from a military base alongside senior defense officials. During his speech, the president announced that efforts are underway to address the root causes of insecurity and violence across the country, including the region of Baja, California. Since Mexican President Felipe Calderón initiated the war on drugs back in 2007, the Mexican military has been trying to crack down on drug cartels involved in the production, distribution, and profit of illegal substances. However, rather than reducing violence, the country has seen a dramatic increase in bloodshed, making it one of the most dangerous places on earth. The arrest of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the infamous leader of the Sinaloa cartel, in 2014, followed by his subsequent rearrest in 2015 and eventual extradition in 2017, created a power struggle within the cartel. This internal strife led to a surge in violence as rival factions fought for control. Between 2007 and 2018, the homicide rate in Mexico tripled, with much of the violence attributed to clashes between rival cartels. As the government intensified its focus on drug trafficking, coupled with changing demand patterns in the United States and other countries, cartels were forced to adapt their strategies to compensate for lost revenue. While there has been a recent decline in overt drug trafficking activities, overall criminal activities and violent homicides continue to rise. Interestingly, the war on drugs not only escalated violence, but also pushed cartels to explore new avenues for profit. One such example is the illegal tapping into the fuel lines owned by Mexico's state petroleum company, Petróleos Mexicanos, Pemex. In an effort to tackle the escalating violence, more troops and National Guard members were sent to cities like Tijuana, providing support to the local police forces. They made several additional arrests, including members of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. However, authorities were still struggling to understand the exact reasons behind the conflicts and violence. The State of Things in Baja, California when the CJNG eventually heard of the arrest of its cartel members and the increase in drug seizures, especially fentanyl and meth labs, they got angry. The Jalisco New Generation Cartel, CJA, issued a grave warning, threatening to unleash violence against anyone they found on the streets during the upcoming weekend in various cities across northern Baja, California. Such messages are deeply disturbing, reflecting the escalating tensions and brazen audacity exhibited by cartels in their pursuit of objectives. It reminds us of the difficulties faced in ensuring the safety of the public and restoring peace in affected areas. After that unsettling warning, roaming bands of criminals set fire to buses, cars, and businesses and put up roadblocks on major streets in the Jalisco and Guanajuato states, leaving one person dead and at least 24 OXO convenience stores torched. In the northern border town of Ciudad Juarez, two people were killed on Thursday in a prison riot between members of the Los Chapos and Los Mexicles groups. Ricardo Mejia, Mexico's deputy security minister, stated that it isn't clear why the group Groups clashed, but in retaliation, members of Los Mexicles went on a killing spree across Juarez, including four radio station employees and a 12-year-old who was shot at a Circle K store. The clashes between rival groups like Los Chapos and Los Mexicles only made the situation worse. These clashes have resulted in retaliatory violence and numerous casualties. As such, in Tijuana, hundreds of additional troops and dozens of National Guard members have now been put in the city to further support the local police force. And officials say 36 people linked to the violence 
assailants were arrested, including three members of the Yalisco New Generation Cartel. It's possible they were also enraged by the recent increase in seizures of fentanyl and meth labs. However, the officials still have no idea what caused Los Chapos and Los Mexicles members to start fighting at the prison in Juarez. Despite Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's sincere efforts to address cartel influence through peaceful measures, the persistent increase in fatalities and alarming displays of cartel power has effectively brought an end to the policy of de-escalation and appeasement advocated by the president's Hugs Not Bullets electoral campaign in 2018. The pressing question now is whether it is possible to contain and diminish the growing strength and audacity of the cartels, which have gained significant momentum in recent years. It remains to be seen if this proverbial genie can be put back into the bottle. During an interview with NPR, Montserrat Caballero, the mayor of Tijuana, understands that some residents are influenced by cartel activities, expressing her determination to change this unfortunate cultural dynamic. Several hundred Tijuana residents gathered in response to the situation, 